Good afternoon, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today on this webinar. Uh, we have quite a number of people who have registered for this meeting, so we're going to give uh, just a few minutes more for people to join. We'll get started in about two minutes, but thank you all so much for joining us today. We look forward to getting started on the webinar. Let's go ahead and get started. So thank you again so much, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Andrew Zaffel, a manager of health equity here at NASTAD. We're excited to have your participation today on our webinar on understanding digital campaign execution, how to use online media in your ending the HIV epidemic work. We look forward to both our present presentation today as well as discussion that we'll be having afterwards. So just quickly going over the agenda today, we're in the right now in the middle of introductions and housekeeping, which I will present. Then I'll be passing it over to my colleague, Jen Hecht, of the Building Healthy Online Communities Coalition to provide a quick overview. And then we'll really get to the heart of the presentation on understanding digital campaign execution. We will then have time for discussion and talk briefly about some of our next steps that we have here at NASDAD, as well as discussions over uh, the next few months of uh, continuous webinars on this topic. Just a bit of housekeeping before we continue. We do ask that please that everyone please mute your computer microphone or telephone during for the presentations. Feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions. We'll address these during the Q&A periods. For those who are on their computer, you can find uh, to the right on this little uh, tab that you have here, uh, a question mark where you can uh, specifically then type in your question there and I can read the question to our presenters, as well as you have the raise hand feature as well in which you'd be able to then ask your question uh, and I can unmute your line when that happens. Please know we'll be waiting towards the end of the presentation uh, to open up the line for questions and uh, either in by typing or through um, yourself asking the question. Uh, but feel free to at any point, feel free to raise your hand or type in the question. We'll be able to make sure that we can ask those to our presenters. A recording of the webinar and slides will be made available after the presentation. Just give us one to two days to get everything online and available. And then for more information, feel free to contact myself. You see my email here at azapful at nasta.org for more information. I'm happy to connect you to our speakers as well as other resources available to help you in this uh, area. With that, I'd like to pass it now over to my colleague, Jen Hecht, at the Building Healthy Online Communities Coalition. Jen has over 20 years of experience in public health with a focus on sexual health and substance use. She has been focused on projects related to sexual health and dating apps and is a co-founder of the Building Healthy Online Communities, a consortium of public health and app owners working together to further HIV and STI prevention. Currently, she is based at San Francisco AIDS Foundation, where she leads program strategy and evaluation and directs the Building Healthy Online Communities Coalition. Jen, I'll pass it over to you now. Good morning slash good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time to participate today. Um, as Andrew said, uh, Building Healthy Online Communities is a consortium of public health organizations that are working with the dating apps. Our partners include NASDAQ, NCSD, CDC, AIDS United, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, and a number of other organizations. And we're working with most of the major dating apps, including Grindr, Scruff, Adam for Adam, Jack, Tinder, and some others. I want to extend a big thank you to NASDAQ, and particularly to Andrew, for helping us to host this webinar. Just briefly about building healthy online communities, we really have three primary goals. First and foremost, we are advocating for changes in the environment of the app. So that usually means looking at the profile options and other features um, so that we can achieve permanent solutions that promote health and reduce stigma. We're also working to coordinate and improve messaging and advertising related to sexual health information and awareness and access to sexual health services. 
And finally, we're working to coordinate interactions with the app to assist them in prioritizing their efforts for the greatest impact. We recently hosted a meeting that was focused on how to improve the effectiveness of online ads for promoting sexual health. And as a result, we've developed a number of new resources, including a clearinghouse for ads that we'll share with you. I'm really excited today to introduce Matt Moss of Water and Stone, who's been working with us on a number of projects over the last couple of years. Matt is a passionate marketing professional with over 15 years of experience leading digital marketing initiatives for blue chip brands, including Singapore Airlines, KB Home, and Viking Cruises, as well as public health groups, including AIDS United, California Department of Public Health, Office of AIDS, Desert AIDS Project, and Ultimed. Matt has been working with BHOC and NASA to help social marketers leverage proven strategies from the for-profit space to be more efficient and effective online so we can bring an end to the HIV epidemic. I'll now turn it over to Matt to begin the first in a series of three webinars. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jen. Um, it's a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, let me make sure you folks can see my screen here. There you go. Um, so uh, thanks. As Jen mentioned, my name is Matt Moss. Um, I founded uh, Water and Stone Marketing about two years ago, um, uh, but I've been working in the space for a very, very long time. Um, I've had the privilege of working with the Office of AIDS and California Department of Public Health, uh, the CDC, and fine folks at NASDAD um, and BHOC uh, for a number of years now. And it's, it's my pleasure to be speaking with you folks here today. Um, so today we're going to go over uh, understanding digital uh, kind of digital campaign execution um, and so you know I'm gonna go I'm gonna move uh, relatively quickly we have a, a number of slides to get through um, and I want to make sure that you folks have time at the end um, so as, as Andrew mentioned if you could just um, type your questions into the chat he'll get them to me um, but I wanted to start today with about planning um, and really we're I'm going to take you through the entire kind of life cycle of a campaign and try to give you some tips uh, for how to make that more efficient and effective. Um, so your plan is really the foundation that your campaign is built on. Um, it's the ruler that we're going to use to measure your campaign success and it's your shield to defend what you did against the scrutiny of others, right? So the plan's really important. <laughs> um, the, you know, when we start with planning, you know, we usually ask a couple of, of, of basic questions that sound, questions that sound basic, but they're actually can be kind of complex to answer. Um, but I'm gonna help give you some of those today. Uh, the first one is what we're trying to achieve and why, which are your goals. Um, you know, the audience that we're trying to reach or the people we're trying to influence, right? Um, and then why that audience should do what you want them to do, right? Which is usually our message. Um, and then also what resources we'll need to reach them. So what is our budget? Um, and really, the answers to these questions should be shared with everybody involved, whether it's your internal stakeholders, right? People who are actually involved in the tactical execution, people involved in approving this process, or maybe even external stakeholders as well, um, including funders or evaluating bodies of any kind. Um, and usually we put all these, we put this together and, um, you know, into an artifact or a document that we call a project brief. Um, and I'll share some of these tools with you folks too and the resources at the end as well. Um, you know, it's really important to set what we call SMART goals, right? And SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Um, so a lot of times when uh, I receive a media brief or when I'm working with an organization, they may say something like, well, we want to raise awareness for PrEP. And that's while that is a noble and definitely a goal, it's not really specific, right? Um, you know, how much do you want to raise awareness of PrEP? Who do you want to raise awareness of PrEP in? You know, those types of questions need to be answered. It's also very difficult to measure um, tangibly, right? Just raising awareness. How are we going to do that? So a more specific goal might be, hey, we want to reach, you know, a million people with a PrEP message, a million MSM of color with a PrEP message by November 15th right? That's a much more specific and measurable goal. Um, and so those are really important. Also the attainability, um, you know, is it possible to reach this goal within our time frame and our budget? And I'll talk a little bit more in some of the following slides on how to set reasonable goals based on budget or reasonable budgets based on goals, give you some tools to do that. Um, also, right, is it relevant? Luckily for us, 
um, you know, a lot of times the CDC is telling us, you know, these are the priority populations, these are the things that we want to message to them so we know that it's relevant and going to help us achieve our end goal. And then timely, right? Every, every goal should have some type of time frame associated with it. And when we talk about media, uh, time frame is really important for a number of reasons, and I'll get into that a little deeper here in a second. Um, so part of that measurability is setting success metrics. Um, and so success metrics are really how, how are we going to measure our success and they should be based on goals. Um, so anytime, you know, if we have a goal of say generating awareness, right, there are a few success metrics that can really support that. Something that we call reach in the media space, which means the number of people that saw our message. Impressions, which are the number of times each person that saw the message saw it. So for example, if I show one message to five people, I had a reach of five and an impression of one. If I show two messages to five people, I had a reach of five and impressions of 10. Um, and then another thing that can help uh, kind of support or show that we drove awareness is traffic to a website. Um, and so, you know, anytime we show an ad to someone, we, we can get metrics that say, hey, this ad was shown, but we really know they saw it if they clicked on it and went through to our website right, and then got some more information. So those are just three basic awareness success metrics that I recommend. Um, if you're trying to demonstrate engagement, there could be things like views of a video, it could be, you could be tracking information downloads, you could also be using social media channels that allow you to see other engagement metrics, such as likes, comments, shares, or reactions. Um, and then finally on here, and, and to me, one of the most important things to track is some type of conversion. Now, when I say conversion, I mean an action that, that a person we are trying to influence is taking or trying to affect. Um, these can be things like clicking to call a phone number. They can be things like filling out a form of some kind. Uh, if you are running a clinic or have a, a, a clinical side to your organization, um, you know, getting them to make an appointment, those types of things, or even getting directions to a care facility. Um, when we start talking about trying to uh, and the HIV epidemic, a lot of the conversion metrics that we want to utilize are to try to get as close to a connection to care as possible. So wherever you fall on that continuum, if we could try to, you know, as close as you can get to showing that you connected someone to care or got them onto care, that's where we want to try to be. Um, so, you know, if you can if you have appointments that are scheduled and you can track how many people actually came in for a prep appointment, saw a physician, got on prep, those are the best conversion metrics. Um, but as far down as you can go, the better. When we talk about who we're trying, so this is what we're trying to do and how we're going to measure it. Now we're going to talk a little bit about who we're trying to reach um, and really how we define our priority population or our target audience, as you'll hear a lot in the media space. Um, and really, there's a number of different ways to do this. Um, you know, the first and most common way, especially in the digital space, is based on demographics. Uh, that's age, race, geography, education level, household income, or marital status. Um, and this information is often found from looking at surveillance data uh, that can be provided by, you know, the CDC or other funding organizations. Also, uh, your contacts in the epi, you know, epidemiological space can, can help with this. Um, you may have internal statisticians that are running these kinds of reports as well. Uh, there's a link here to the CDC site where you can get statistics. So if you don't have your own kind of profile already made, you can go to a number of these organizations or it could be even written into your grants and find information on, okay, who should I be targeting? Um, once you kind of have the demographics though, that's really just a, let's call it a silhouette of a person. Um, now you want to fill that silhouette in. Um, and really this is where psychographics come in. And these are based on behaviors and values. So these are things like, what do these people want or aspire to? What do they believe in? What do they value? What motivates them? Um, and why do they engage in, in behaviors that we may want to change? or why would they choose to be, engage in behaviors we want them to take, right? These are things that require a little more either um, research or, you know, kind of uh, trial and error to figure out. Um, so, you know, and a lot of times you're not going to have data for psychographics um, or the time or resources to do formative research. So, you know, this is where digital can be very helpful. 
just make some assumptions and test them during your campaign, right? So for example, if I'm trying to reach MSM of color living in Los Angeles, I may presume that some of those people might be interested in pride. So I may go look up all the different pride, uh, you know, the different prides that are happening in and around Los Angeles and try to target people who also like those things. Um, you know, there could be another um, of other aspects and we'll get into more targeting later, but these are kind of the two areas where you really want to try to define your priority population better. So when we also talk about those psychographics, you know, what drives an individual, it's really helpful to talk to members of your target audience if you can, um, or to try to access, uh, you know, secondary research that's already been done from other organizations to see why they either have or haven't taken an action in the past. Um, we really want, you know, to know why they would want to take advantage of the service that we're offering. And a lot of times this is, you know, why I think they should take advantage of a service I'm offering is one thing, but why they think they should can often be a different thing. Um, and so, you know, it's really important to try to get that perspective, um, especially if you are creating your own campaign from scratch. Um, it's very, very important, especially in this space, to try to involve members of the communities you're trying to reach in that development process. Um, and developing creative from scratch is not always the best thing, and we'll talk about that a little more, but if you should, you should involve the audience. Um, you might also want to identify and leverage existing campaigns, right? Instead of creating your own from scratch that have similar priority populations. And this can significantly help reduce uh, the time and cost of developing creative. Oftentimes campaigns can cost in the tens of thousands of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce. And the budget you have left to then actually go show that campaign to people and affect change is, is significantly reduced. So um, if you can avoid that, it, it's helpful too from a budgetary perspective. Um, and then lastly here, like what kinds of media do they consume, right? Are these people reading the Wall Street Journal? Are they on CNN.com? Maybe not. So we may wanna think about, okay, what are they consuming? Are they on Instagram all day long? Are they on Grindr a lot? Yeah, maybe, you know? So let's, we need to put our messages where they're going to be consuming other types of media. So once we define our priority population, we've got some goals and objectives, we have our priority population, now we have to figure out, okay, what should our budget be? You know, a lot of times you're going to start with one thing or the other. You're either going to start with a bunch of goals and try to figure out a budget, or you're going to have a budget and then need to figure out what can I achieve with this. So we're going to start with setting a budget based on goals, because I find more often than not, this is where I'm beginning with a lot of organizations in the social marketing space. So uh, your budget for media should always be based on your goals. And if you have information from the past, estimates from the past, right? From past performance. Uh, a lot of you aren't gonna have any uh, data from past perform campaign performance, which is why it's really, really important that organizations that do have data share it with one another. Um, and a big part of my uh, my working with building healthy online communities is to help streamline and disseminate campaign information. Um, you know, and in order to so that other organizations like yourselves can make informed decisions or at least have a baseline, right, a, a watermark to start from, and then see if you go above or below that. But something to give you an idea. So there's a kind of a quick little table here. Um, that I put together that will show you and kind of give you an understanding of some principles that will help you calculate or project. Um, and so let's say we started with a goal to get 15 MSM to enroll in prep using Facebook advertising over the next three months, right? Um, if I have the information in pink, I can figure out what my budget should be. And this information doesn't have to be actual right? I can estimate it and get ballparks. So I started with conversions. So our conversion is getting 15 people, 15 MSM to sign up to enroll in prep. So that's 15. Um, I have a conversion rate based on past campaigns I've done, which I've inserted here of 0.1%. So I know if that, what that means is that 0.1% of the people who come to my website 
will sign up for prep, right? So I can take that 0.1%, right? And divide it by 15 to get how many clicks I would need to drive, which is 15,000, right? To my website in order to get 15 conversions if I know I have a 0.1% conversion rate, right? So as we move to the left from there, if I also know that my cost per click is 30 cents on Facebook, and this is actual data from a recent campaign, um, then I can then take that and multiply it by 1500, the number of clicks I'm gonna generate, um, and get a budget of $4,500, which is on the right-hand side. Um, and then lastly, I know if I have a click-through rate, so the number of people that see my campaign, only 4% of them are gonna click, right? So then I can take 15,000 clicks and divide it by 4% to get the number of impressions, the number of times I will need to show my ad to generate 15,000 clicks, and that's on the far left. Um, and these, this information, as I said, in pink can be made up. You can guess, or you can ask somebody, right? You could reach out to the CDC and say, hey, we're doing this type of campaign. Do you guys have any data on click-through rate, cost per click, or conversion rate for these types of metrics? Or as I mentioned earlier, you can just take your best guess and then as you're running your campaign, reevaluate, right? Take a look at how you're doing. Are you exceeding these goals? Are you, are, are you coming in under them? You know, what's going on? And kind of assess as you move. Um, so once you've got kind of this estimated budget here, um, like I said, start running your ads and, and see how your actuals compare and adjust accordingly. And then if you don't have any previous data um, and you have no, you can't find any data, it's helpful to just start by trying to think about, okay, how big is my target audience? If I want to reach all of them, how can I reach them four times, right? Just start with an impression based on that. Um, and that data can be found by looking at the geographic area you're trying to affect, um, taking 40, you know, 48% of it and allocating that to men, and then taking 5% of that as a estimated MSM population, um, just at, at very broad strokes, right? And try to see, okay, you know, if there's 100,000 MSM in my area that I can possibly reach and I wanna hit them all four times, I need 400,000 impressions, right? And so you can work back to a, a cost from there. Um, trying to generate uh, awareness is one thing, but trying to get someone to take an action takes a lot more impressions. I usually double it. so. You know, I would say guess on, on eight impressions if you want them to try to like fill out a form, uh, call a phone number, get directions to a clinic, anything like that, um, I would up your estimate. And these are, these are just general kind of ballparks to help you folks. Um, obviously, every location is going to be different. Um, but that's, if you have a goal, right, this is one way you can work back out to what should my budget be to achieve that goal. The other way to start is if you've already got a budget in mind, right? So a lot of times um, you've received, your organization has received funding through a larger grant um, and a portion of that has already been allocated to a particular campaign. So um, you know that you already have a budget of X number of dollars. In this case, I'm gonna say, hey, you have $500 to raise awareness of an HIV outbreak to MSM of color in Augusta, Georgia. Um, so you already know you have a budget. Now you can use a similar formula to get, okay, what can I actually achieve for that budget? Um, and so the first step would be to start looking at where you can get, in this case, because I wanna build awareness, right? Awareness uh, can only be generated if I reach people um, and show them a message. Um, and so, in a, in when you're trying to get awareness, reach is your number one goal, right? Um, and the, the biggest reach you can have, the more awareness you're gonna generate. So in this case, I would look for, okay, what are the lowest cost vehicles online that can give me access to my audience? Um, and then I would use a low frequency because I wanna show this to as many people as possible. So I'd only show it to you know them once or twice um, and then get my message out that way. Um, a, when you're looking at these different channels, and we'll go into a bunch of different channels in a second here, um, but particularly let's talk about Facebook. They're all gonna sell media 
uh, a couple of different ways. One main way they sell media is based on CPM or cost per thousand impressions. Don't ask me why in the media space we decided to make M equal a thousand instead of a million. In the media space, MM is a million. Um, it's a very old school, uh, back from I guess from when the Romans were doing advertising, this, this really took off. Um, but cost per thousand, um, they'll charge you based on that metric. So if they have a cost per thousand of impressions of $12, that means that you can show your message to, for, with a $500 budget, you can show your message to 41,666 MSM of color once, or you can show your message to 20,833 MSM of color twice, right? So if I'm trying to generate awareness and I wanna reach as many people as possible, keeping my frequency low, if I keep my frequency to one, I'm gonna reach twice as many people as I will if I up my frequency to two. So that's just part of the thinking on why we would keep it very, a lower frequency, as opposed to what I showed you on the other slide of four or eight times, um, if just maximizing awareness is your goal, lower frequency. Um, if an action is required, right, then we can do the same type of calculation, but some of these will be based on cost per click instead of cost per impression. So certain channels will sell you a click, like I showed you on the previous slide here. Facebook might charge me 30 cents a click, right? Um, and so then I can do the same thing if I'm trying to generate clicks and using these metrics Will, will help significantly. Um, there is this, so once I have kind of my campaign and I have my budget and I've picked my media channels and I'm running them, it's very, very important to monitor and adjust during your campaign. Uh, digital media is not something that you can set and forget. One of the reasons why, uh, there's a plethora of them, but one of the reasons why is that you know, over time, increasing your media spend will eventually lead to diminishing returns. So you want to figure out what your optimal frequency is to show someone a message. Um, and this is based on a, this is because the more ads that I show to an audience of people, the more people will convert. But the rate of the conversion is going to start to diminish after a certain frequency and that's optimal frequency and this happens because i'm basically paying more and more money to show my entire audience this message more and more times so people who are less likely to convert within a week within two weeks within a month because they saw three ads will start converting once they see four ads less of them will start of my population will start converting once they see five ads even less will start converting once they see six etc but i'm still paying to show six ads to everybody in that population um, and so over time the cost per conversion will escalate and this is some campaign data i had from a campaign that i did uh, for the california department of public health in la um, and over the course of a month, we found that the optimal frequency for reaching MSM of color in Los Angeles was five, right? Because you can see my cost on this chart going down over time till we hit that five mark. And then after we started showing them six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 uh, ads, they, it started to drop off again. My cost per conversion started to go up. Um, and so if you're monitoring this and you can find your optimal frequency, then you can choose to, if you have the ability to extend your campaign, you'll be able to, instead of only showing your campaign for two months, maybe show it for two and a half months and get more people to take the action you want, or three months, or four months, or six months, right? Because what's when we're talking about HIV prevention modalities, these are what we call long lead time, high involvement decisions, right? This isn't an impulse buy. This isn't me walk, checking out at the grocery store and seeing a pack of gum I want and grabbing it, right? There could be factors in my life that are preventing me from taking, uh, from taking advantage of your message now. There could be situational changes that happen later that all of a sudden make prep more uh, important to me at that moment in my life. And so it's important for our campaign to spend efficiently so that we can stay in front of this audience for a longer period because different people are going to be in the marketplace for prep or in the marketplace for an hiv test at different times depending on where they are in their own lives um, and so the longer we can show these messages 
um, to this audience, the more successful we're going to be. Um, and that's why it's very important to optimize your campaign and spend. So once we've got all this media running, we've set our budget, we're running and we're looking at it, it's really important to track and to analyze, right? So we can optimize. Um, there's a couple of tools here that I'm gonna share that are really, really important on how to do this. Um, the first is Google Analytics. Uh, so any digital uh, property, a website, an app, anything you have should be collecting analytics and it should be doing that through google um, and you know this is really important because this tool lives on your website or your digital property and it can provide the most accurate information about things like where your traffic is coming from and how how long they're on your site what actions they're taking while they're there what type of browser are they looking at what type of language uh do they speak a lot of demographic information can also be available through this tool. It's, it's very, very powerful and very important, and it's free. Um, and I've got a link at the back of this on how to set up Google Analytics if you don't already have it in our resource section. Um, with Google Analytics, um, you can also set up goals in Google Analytics, things like, okay, once they go to the homepage, they fill out a form, or they click to get directions, or they click to download this thing. Thing. And that will allow you to see when visitors are taking specific actions on your site. Um, when we pair Google Analytics with another Google product called Google Tag Manager, we can also then start to attribute all of these actions on your website back to ads um, and or any communication that we put out. So whether it's an email, a social media post, or a, an advertisement that we showed, all of these things can now start to be tracked down to, hey, when I ran an ad on Facebook, I got 17 MSM of color living in Los Angeles to sign up for a prep appointment or to view this PDF, right, from this one particular ad. So that information is really powerful and helpful. Um, so I highly recommend setting up Google Tag Manager as well um, because it's essential for tracking interactions and then attributing it back to a source. Um, I've got another tutorial, a little video tutorial at the end of this in the resource section. So check that out on how to do that. I'm um, gonna just take a long time and can get complicated. So I'm gonna breeze over that for now. And then also any platform that you're advertising on in the digital space will have its own tracking system or dashboard. Um, you know, Facebook and Instagram use something called Ads Manager or you may see Facebook Insights. Uh, on your profile pages and those types of things. Uh, you know, Grindr has its own dashboard on its self-serve ads, Twitter, YouTube, they all have, have their own kind of metrics um, for what goes on on their platform. It's really important to also utilize whichever platforms, the analytics tools that they have, because they're gonna give you information on what's happening in their universe before the person leaves that universe and comes over to your website. Um, so really we have to merge these two kinds of reports or these two data sources um, between Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager and the native analytics platforms so we can get a complete picture of what's going on. Uh, evaluation of your campaign. So we're gonna talk about, okay, how do we evaluate now? Um, and that should take place at regular intervals and be based on consistent metrics that demonstrate success. Uh, I can't stress enough how important it is to try to keep your metrics consistent because that's really the only way that we can then compare things, similar things, right? And, and make reasonable decisions. Um, and I like to do weekly evaluation and monthly reports um, as a, you know, kind of a, a, a good reporting interval. Um, but depending on your resources that you have, you could, uh, you could lower this amount, right? You may not have the resources to pay or you may not have the time, right, to go look at it every single week. So you may do every two weeks, right? Um, you may only do a monthly report, but try to start with looking at your campaign at least weekly and reporting on it monthly um, over time. That will help you significantly. Um, also, you know, we besides just resources, there could be a number of other barriers standing between you and the outcomes you're trying to achieve. But all of these outcomes can be achieved with the right strategy. So um, we're gonna talk about next in this, a few ways to overcome common barriers that both I and my colleagues at BHOC and NASDAQ have heard repeatedly. 
um, from organizations that we work with. So uh, the first kind of digital marketing barrier that we hear all the time is a platform or channel restriction. Um, I'm not allowed to advertise on dating apps. Um, and so, you know, while dating apps and or hookup apps, whatever you want to call them, I'm going to refer to them as dating apps as we move forward here, like Grindr can be or jacked or scruff atom for atom right hornet they can be really effective ways to reach msm there are other channels like facebook instagram and google that can be just as effective and in some cases even more efficient depending on your ability to target your priority population so if you feel and so there are other options but if you are running into this barrier and you feel like apps are still an essential part of your mix, your media mix, and really important, then you can consider working with a third party ad agency or another community-based organization to place ads on your behalf, right? So, um, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, certain organizations won't be able to run on Grindr and they will come to an organization like myself and say, okay, we want a campaign we're going to give you this X number of dollars and then you go run on the media channels you think are best. But as an agency, I can give them one more layer of insulation from that. Or they may provide that to building healthy online communities who then comes to an agency and then it's a building healthy online communities campaign instead of the California Department of Public Health campaign. Um, and so then that way you can kind of shield yourself from those and still reach your target audience. Um, Another common barrier that we get all the time um, is around campaign and ad approval issues. And so there's really two facets here. The first facet is internal. Um, you know, I can't get the campaign I want to run approved by, you know, our public relations arm, you know, by compliance, by whoever internally before I even go outside. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times, we can get around this by um, just using creative that's already been approved, right? So the CDC has campaigns that have been approved to run nationally that you can use for free. Um, there are also other uh, organizations that have produced campaigns um, and the BHOC has an ad clearinghouse that I'll give you a link to here that you can also go to to find existing campaigns that you may be able to utilize. Um, and then the second side of I can't get my campaigns approved. So if you can get them approved internally, then you've got to run them. Um, and a lot of times different media channels have their own restrictions on what you can or can't say in your ads, right? So it's important if you do decide to go and develop from scratch to have an understanding or the people you hire to develop for you have an understanding of what those restrictions are before you start developing your creative. Um, and so I've also included some links here to some resources that uh, can be very helpful in this. And I've discovered these through trial and error, right? Because um, a lot of these, particularly Google and Facebook, they have blanket statements that say, look, you, can't, you cannot target someone based on an existing health condition or based on a, you know, based on sexual preference or based on ethnicity. Right, and so those can often be barriers, um, but there are ad policies here that you can look at, um, and also consulting with an agency who's done this before or a partner organization that has done this in the space before can be very helpful in shortening that approval process. Um, another marketing barrier we run into all the time is a budget, what we're calling a budget cliff, um, and that's, I have to spend everything by June 30th, uh, but I'm not ready. Um, or, you know, I don't have a campaign ready yet and I was supposed to spend this money. So a lot of times um, that can be, we can get around that by partnering with a third party, either agency or community-based organization as well. Um, and really, you know, giving the budget to them to hold in trust or escrow for our campaign until it's ready can often be a way to get around this. So again, important to reach out talk to other organizations in your space, see you know, what they're able to do um, and look at that. Um, also budget size is a common uh, you know, issue here. Um, and for most organizations have less money than they'd like um, and they're looking for existing, you know, it, it helps to look for existing campaigns 
Um, and here's a link to the clearinghouse, right, that I mentioned earlier, and the CDC. Th these both have a lot of free campaigns you can utilize. Um, and then also just reach out to each other and see if people will share. Um, depending on the size of your market and the competition for your audience, you might be pleasantly surprised with how far your money can go in Facebook, Google Display Ads, those types of things. Um, you know, we can very, very low cost. I mean, even with $500, right, we can we can reach thousands of people in a given area. So uh, there are creative ways around it. Um, now we've talked a little bit about barriers. We've talked about planning. I'm going to talk about different media channels that are really, really important in the space. And I, I know I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to try to keep this to about 10 minutes. So we have 10 minutes left for Q&A. Um, but the right media channel will really let you read the right, the right priority population with a compelling message when they're willing to receive it and for a reasonable cost. Um, so different digital media channels we're going to go over um, are Google Display Network, um, which lets you run ads across millions of websites and apps based on user information. Facebook and Instagram, which are the two most popular social media platforms, which also let us run ads on their social networks. Um, and then last but not least, dating apps like Grindr, Adam for Adam, et cetera. Um, and so Google Display Network, this channel will give you access to the most people of any media channel you can come across. Um, it's millions of users across millions of websites, um, hundreds of millions of users across millions of websites. Um, and it really offers also the widest variety of targeting parameters. So we can get a very, very specific audience. We can do a really good job of creating a profile of the MSM we want to reach and then targeting them. Um, Google also lets you pay for ads based on a number of different metrics and the most different ways of any other platform. So we can buy ads based on impression, like I talked about earlier. You can buy based on click. You can actually buy based on conversion. If you're tracking conversions through your site, through Google Tag Manager and Google Analytics, you can pay $1.30 to have someone fill out a form, and they're only going to charge you based on how many people fill out forms. Um, so these are just really, really good ways um, for us to take advantage of. And it allows us, you know, Google also allows you to buy based on real time bidding. So you're only paying what, you know, what the market is paying for ads, um, which is important. And we'll talk about the differences later. Um, but because of its fast reach um, and highly customizable targeting capabilities, Google Display Network can be one of the most efficient and effective digital advertising channels for marketers that know how to use it. And why that's important is because. On Google, in order to be efficient, you need to build a good audience. So if you don't know how to reach MSM or how to define them within the parameters Google allows, then it can be challenging. So we'll talk about some other ways of targeting here with Google. You can target based on demographic, right? So gender, age, household income, marital status, or parental status, et cetera. So usually trying to reach MSM, um, we start with men, 18 to 54, um, and and not necessarily apparent just to help narrow right and we're just we're making broad assumptions here but we're trying to narrow it down um, then we would add affinity or custom affinity targeting to that um, which basically allows you to show ads to people based on interest groups whether they're foodies health and fitness buffs news junkies avid readers these affinity groups are buckets that google puts people into based on their behaviors online right so we can look at men's media fans um, when we're targeting these groups. We can also start to customize these and look for things that, um, that will help. So what type of sites do they like? What type of media are they consuming, right? We can add those to the mix to build our own custom affinity groups to make sure we're getting our message out. Um, and really when you're utilizing these, it's really for getting your message out to as many people as possible. Once we start to customize, intent audiences and use custom intent audiences this is where we start to add keywords right things they may be searching for right are they already searching for prep are they searching for pride are they searching for you know um msm other msms online what are they looking at how are they searching we can add those and really start to customize and then our audience and really start to hone in on okay are we doing a complete audience and at the back of this document we have a resource link to a keyword list and affinity groups that um, BHOC has collected from a number of different organizations doing ads to MSM to help you with a, a starting point, right, to building these audiences. And then last but not least, Google lets us remarket. Um, this is really important. 
um, remarketing is showing your ads to people who have already been to your website, they are ultimately going to be the most likely to convert. Um, and but some of you may be restricted based on the content of your site on whether or not you can even do remarketing. If you're allowed to, I recommend it. It's going to be the most efficient type of digital marketing you can do. Facebook and Instagram, right? We're all familiar with these social platforms. You can buy, again, based on demographic or geography. You can also do interest-based targeting here, um, which means we can get very, very specific, much like Google with affinity groups and those types of things. Um, it will allow you to pay for ads based on the number of times your ads have seen, so impressions, clicks, conversions, um, video views, and a whole bunch of other stuff, and it's also real-time bidding. So very similar to Google, but you're only on Facebook and Instagram. Um, one of the good things about being on Facebook and Instagram though is that when people are on these platforms they're in an exploratory mode so they're already looking for content they're willing to go out and explore they're highly likely to click not always the case with some of the other media channels um, and I'll talk about that here with dating apps so in particular dating apps right there's a number of these you're familiar with them um, but these because of the nature of the application the, the biggest strength of dating apps is that you're guaranteed to reach MSM, right? If you're on an MSM focused dating app. Um, so it's, it's a really good way to not have to build your own custom audience, but these apps charge a premium for reaching that MSM audience, right? So they make it really easy, but they're charging you more than Facebook or Google will charge you when they, when you get to the cost per thousand of impressions. And most of them will only let you buy media based on the number of impressions you're purchasing from them and a geographic area. So not a lot of targeting allowed here um, and not a lot of purchase options and they're setting the price. So they can say, hey, we're gonna charge $20 per thousand impressions instead of where Facebook can only charge 12 because that's what the market will bear, right? On Facebook, it's a bidding system. So buying direct can be a challenge uh, from a cost perspective too. So that kind of covers in a whirlwind <laughs> uh, the different media channels and kind of execution. So I wanted to save some time for questions. Um, so Andrew, I don't know if we've had any questions come through. We have, thank you so much. First, a big thank you so much for that great presentation and already already getting some comments and I, even some emails I've just gotten on uh, how great this presentation was and request for slides. Just a reminder to everyone, all this, uh, this webinar has been recorded and slides will be made available after the presentations. We do ask to just give us a day or two just to be able to compile all the information and be able to present it to you all. But everyone who is registered for this webinar will receive an email with a link to the slides as well as the recording of the webinar itself. Um, I just a reminder as well, if anyone has any questions, you're free to now either use the raise your hand feature where I can then unmute your line and you can ask the question directly, or feel free to also ch type it in the chat box feature as well. Um, so Matt, I'll go ahead and get started with uh, this question I had a couple of times, and I think it'd be really helpful, you know, there's a bit of confusion still a little around reach versus impressions. I was wondering if maybe you could just explain again the difference between reach and impression as well as maybe give an example or two. Sure. So reach is the number of people that saw my message at least one time, right? So if I show one ad to five people, I have a reach of five, right? If I show it to them one single time. Impressions are the number of times my ad was seen in total. So reach times frequency, the number of times each person in that, that I reached saw my ad equals impressions. So if I, show an, if I show two ads to five people, right, then I have a reach of five because I only reached five people, but I have impressions of 10 because each of them saw my ad twice, right? There was a frequency of two, so five times two equals 10 for impressions. Does that make sense? That does, thank you, I appreciate that. And I think again, you know, when we share out the slides, we'll be able to also um, talk more about that. Okay, I'd like to open it up now for any questions you may have. Jen, while we're waiting for questions, I, uh, while you're still on the line, I know that um, Matt really talked a bit about the, the compendium of all the resources we're trying to collect on just different online advertisements. Do you want to describe a bit more about that and how people might be able to share their own resources um, as they develop them? 
Absolutely, yeah. So first off, um, bhocpartners.org is the home base. Um, if you if you type in bhocpartners.org slash ads, you will get to the clearinghouse. And again, we'll send these resources out. And you'll be able to search for um, different ads that we have been able to compile that are available for you to use. Some of them you can use kind of immediately. Some of them may require an extra step of getting permission um, and the contact information is available there. Thank you for pulling that up as we speak. Um, it is beautiful and it was, uh, we worked very closely with Matt on creating this as well as um, our designer, Annabelle Mangold. Um, so we're really excited about this and we highly encourage you to use it. If you have ad campaigns that you've done and you want to share them, we are very eager to include them. So please send us information um, about your campaign so we can include it. And um, to the extent that you have data on the campaign, you know, how much you spend, how many clicks you got, et cetera, we are also working on compiling that information. Again, that makes it easier because what we can do is then benchmark and it gives us a better sense of, well, in this one example, you know, it costs this much to get this many conversions or this many clicks, but in another example, it was different. And the more examples we have of that, the better we can give guidelines and guideposts for what you might expect to spend on any kind of future campaign. Um, we are also gathering information. If you've ever had an experience of having an ad rejected, um, we would love to hear about that. We wanna make sure that we are working with our partners and um, with the social media platforms to, to request clarity um, of those policies and of the appeal process, which is not always as transparent as we might like. So we're gathering that information. Um, and um, you can also uh, gather, you can look at information as well about um, where, what kinds of um, Facebook affinity groups you might use or Google um, keywords. Um, that's a, that's a um, yep, there we go. <laughs> that's a document that we've just been finalizing. And if you have other examples that you wanna share with us, you can do that and we will amend and update this document. It's really just meant as a starting point if this is something you haven't done before. It's definitely encouraged to do some exploration with it and experimentation yourself, but we really wanna make sure for people who haven't done it before that they have a place to start. Um, so hopefully that's helpful in terms of we are working on gathering as many different resources as possible. We will also be posting this webinar as well as the subsequent webinars, um, which We'll be sending out information for there'll be another one in january and a third one in february and i'll, I'll pause there and see if there's any other questions that have come in yeah quick question for you jen if someone wants to share an ad for inclusion who should they reach out to great i think we have a note on the um, one of those documents but they can certainly either email it to me or to our project manager tony taylor so that'll be tony taylor at bhocpartners.org Awesome, thank you. And again, for those who are on the call and you know are affiliated with NASDAQ, feel free to also reach out to myself, Andrew Zapfel, azapfel at nasdaq.org, and I'm happy to connect you with our colleagues at Building Healthy Online Communities to keep it easier. And as you can see from the screen, we also have their emails available um, right now as well. Uh, so we got a few more questions. Um, and first, let me get to the, this final question online, and then we have someone who has raised their hand to ask a question. Um, this is less of a question, more of a situation. I appreciate maybe your thoughts on this. Um, this person had a social marketing campaign focused on normalizing STI screening, and it was mm -hmm. rejected by Google due to sexual content. Um, and and the photos were considered G-rated, but we did there was use of terms like sexual health, which were flagged by Google. And it took a few appeals to, a few appeals to get the ad approved. Have you had any of those experiences, or what kind of you know <laughs> lessons learned, or how would you say to go about doing working through this in the future? Yes. So, um, yes, I have had those experiences many, many times. Um, you know, I've had the experience where Google has let me run an ad for months on end and then we shut it down. And then as soon as we go to rerun it, they now flag that same ad that I just ran a million times already and, and block it. So, um, I can tell you this, uh, it's totally, unfortunately, um, Google and Facebook, um, it's first, it's an algorithm and then it's a person. 
that basically looks at this. Um, and depending on who that person is and how they're feeling that day, that's basically going to determine whether or not you get approved. The approval process, as Jen mentioned, is very long and arduous. Uh, most of the time, what I do is I pull down my ad, I change a couple of keywords, and I put it right back up as quickly as I possibly can. Um, because, and I can't tell you how many times that's worked, um, just because it doesn't trigger the same type of thing and it doesn't, um, it doesn't get on their radar as quickly, even though it's the exact same creative. The other side of this too, so there's a targeting side, who you're trying to show your ad to. Then there's also a, a messaging side. And so anytime you have an ad that says like, that refers to the person seeing it directly, you're gonna run into problems. So a simple language change sometimes can help, um, but it kind of depends you know, on, on why. And, and unfortunately the answer is never a good one. So you know, you just, my advice would be, tweak a few things in your campaign without changing all of your creative and then just try to keep putting it back up and resubmitting. Um, and while you go through the normal channels of like appeal, right? Where you say like, hey, this actually is, doesn't have anything to do with you know, illicit sexuality. It has to do more with uh, public health. Um, and we'd really appreciate it if you let this run or if you could give us kind of some feedback on how to change it. Um, and unfortunately that process takes weeks. Um, it's never days. <laughs> so that's why I was saying, simultaneously just repost it, change a few things, mostly in your targeting, and then just repost it as quickly as possible. Because more often than not, it'll, as long as it's not egregious and getting complaints, it'll sneak through the second, third time. Awesome. Thank you so much. We've got, I think we have time for two more questions. So first what I'm going to do is I know uh, Rodrigo, you, I, you've had your hand raised for a bit, so my apologies, uh, but let me try to unmute your line now. Rodrigo, if you, your, your line's on mute if you'd like to ask your question. Rodrigo? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh. Might have missed them, but we will definitely follow up. And for anyone who has any additional questions, and for those who may have gotten to their questions on the uh, question box, we haven't gotten to them, I will share with our speakers and make sure that we follow up as well. Um, but I think the last question maybe we can land on is a question from Megan. Uh, do you have any examples of campaigns for a, an audience of foreign born residents or immigrants? or information on best channels to reach these, this target audience um, or examples of any campaigns so much for foreign born as well as uh, those who've immigrated? So really good question, Megan. Uh, thank you. Um, I haven't done a, an HIV prevention campaign to those folks uh, recently. Um, I did do a vaccination campaign for the LA Department of Public Health to those, um, you know, to those folks. And depending on you know, the age range that you're going for, um, those channels can change, right? A lot of those people are, you know, a lot of those populations, um, depending on where they live in their age range, again, might be consuming media differently. So for the younger generations um, of, of that are immigrating here, you know, digital is still a very, very, very strong channel, right? So um, whether you're talking about social media or even Google, because you can target based on uh, language preference too. So if they, you know, whatever language they speak, you can target sites that um, that are in that language, and and then your geographic location. So let's say you're talking about uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I can reach anyone who speaks Chinese in Minneapolis, Minnesota, within those ranges with my message, right? And so that, that's, you know, I, I like digital for that regard. There are also though these the older generations of these populations also still consume a lot of what I will call niche media, right? So they may be reading a, a certain type of paper that's published in their language. They may be looking, you know, reading magazines and those types of things too. Um, I've still found that digital can be very effective, but you also may want to consider those depending on the age range. Great. I know we have one minute left now, but I just wanted to give a big, big thank you to Matt Moss and Jen Hecht from Building Healthy Online Communities Coalition, providing a incredible webinar. There was a lot of amazing information shared here. And again, I'm receiving a lot of comments now on how um, useful this information was. So thank you again, Matt, so much. Andrew, can I make one last plug? Sorry. Oh, um, I just wanted to, I have a next step screen here. I wanted to say we have a digital advertising on a limited budget coming up 121. Um, I've got a media brief in this deck. If you want to fill that out um, and send it to me based on any campaigns you may have, I can do a 
campaign plan around that for the upcoming uh, presentation or use it, maybe use it as an example. So just that was my last thing. Well, thank you so much. Uh, just a note there, we haven't opened registration yet up for the webinar, but we, the registration will be opening up very soon. I will definitely include all this information as well to know for people to be um, have materials beforehand. Uh, but thank you again and be on the lookout for additional webinars on this topic in the future. Wishing everyone a great rest of your day and thank you again so much for joining us today. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks thank so you much. all. All right. Bye-bye.